You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the International Wealth Builder Radio Talk Show. I am your host, Michelle Estelle, the home buyer coach here on KCAA Broadcasting Network, 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. We are affiliated with CNBC, NBC, NBC News, and NBC Sports, where we cover over 5 million households in the greater Los Angeles area. If you've missed any of our previous shows, you can watch them on our TV streaming channel distribution on Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV, and the Android app. Just subscribe to the Building Solid Foundations channel and check out our previous shows. So as your home buyer coach, I um, am going to be talking about all things buying homes today. And the topics we're going to cover are property taxes in California. We are going to cover how adjustable rate mortgages work. And we are going to cover what things affect the interest rates. Why do they go up? Why do they go down? And what economic news we should look out for and which economic news affects an upward movement versus a downward movement. And then we're gonna close out with just some tidbits on owning a home. So to start off this first segment, we are gonna be talking about property taxes. So I often get calls where my previous clients or current clients receive some type of a tax bill or notification where it covers a tax year when they did not own their home. So for instance, they bought their home in 2020 and they get a tax notification, tax bill, supplemental tax, something that refers to taxes in 2019 and they automatically think that they didn't own the home in 2019 so this possibly is not their tax bill. Well, this is where we get to explain how the property taxes in California work. First of all, the tax year is not the same as a calendar year. It doesn't run from January to December. It runs from July 1 to June 30th. So if you remember when you were in school or if you have kids in school, usually your school year covers two years because it starts in the fall of one year and ends in the summer of the next year. Your tax bill is very similar. It starts July 1 in one year and ends in June 30th the next year. So currently we have a tax bill, active tax bill to installments due that is for the tax year 2022, 2023. So anybody buying a house right now in 2023, the current tax bill is also covering the second half of 2022. So in thinking of that, you would understand the two tax installments that are due as well on a bill for a tax year, the new bill comes out in generally in October. When that bill comes out in October of 2023, it's going to be for the 2023-2024 tax year. Currently, we are on an October 2022 bill that's going through to the next year, this year, 2023. On the 2022-2023 bill, which came out October 2022, the first installment of taxes was due in December of 2022. It actually was due when the bill came out in October, but it's delinquent by December 10th. So you have to pay it by December 10th to avoid a penalty. That's in the year 2022. The second installment would be due this year, April, and it's due and delinquent by April 10th, or you have a penalty, of 2023. The tax installments are not even equal months apart. You have one for the year in due and payable in December by the 10th and one due and payable in April by the 10th. So the time frame between them, uh, January, February, March, April, four to five months between the two installments that cover a 12 month period that covers half of one year and half of another year. So if you ever receive a tax bill that is from a time frame that you didn't own the home, that is why. Another reason why you receive a tax bill covering that entire year is because the county only issues one tax bill. 
for each year to the property. The owners may change, but they don't get a new tax bill. They're only going to get the new tax bill the next year that a tax bill is generated. So if they were to close escrow, let's say in December of this year, 2023, there's not going to be another tax bill until October of 2024, which is going to be have that installment due in December as well. So almost a year later, they're going to get their bill for the current taxes. Now, if the bill issued when you bought your house was issued to the seller, but you're paying for the second installment in April, let's say, if you're, the example is you still closed in December, you're going to pay that installment in April because you close in December and you own the, the home halfway through that tax year or even less through the tax year. So when you pay your taxes and when you close escrow, they are doing a proration of the current bill which means that the seller is paying their part and the buyer is paying their part. And whomever pays the bill through escrow will either get a credit or be debited and the other party get a credit for the amount that's due for each party. So think about this. If you're buying a home that the seller has owned for 40 years, and he bought the home for $100,000 and you are paying $600,000. His tax assessment value is what he's paying taxes on. So 100,000 with 2% increase each year is still gonna be a very low tax bill for him. So when that tax bill is issued into escrow for the current year when you're buying the home and each pays their own, you're only paying as the buyer the prorated amount of the seller's tax bill with his assessed value. But now you're buying the home for, let's say, 600000 So your tax assessment value, your, your um, assessed value is going to be based on the 600000 or so. And so obviously your taxes are going to be greater. So what's going to happen is that the county is going to reassess your property down the road, issue a new bill, for you for the new tax year. And they're gonna go back to the date you purchased the home on the old tax bill. And they're gonna recapture the tax that you owe at your assessed value. What that's called is a supplemental tax. So before we get into supplemental tax, let's back up a little bit. Right now, the propositions uh, for taxes, um, basically Prop 13 protects the rapid appreciation of your home and having to pay taxes very quickly on a higher amount. So your assessed value at the time of purchase is X. Each year, the assessor can reassess your property, but the increase in the assessed value cannot exceed 2%, or at least the taxes you pay on that increase. So 2% per year of appreciation and reassessment. That's the maximum that can go up is 2% per year. So as we saw in the previous few years, appreciation was at a greater growth, obviously, than 2%. So if your property went up um, 50000 in a year, but the assessed value can only go up 2%, that kind of protects a slow growth or a slow increase of your taxes that you pay on the property. But once the title is transferred in some way, so even internally you to your um, to someone else in your family or some something like that could be subject to a reassessment. But as long as you just own the home, your value is only reassessed at 2% per year. But when you've purchased a home from a seller who had a very low assessed value, and then your property now is a transfer of title between a buyer and a seller that triggers a reassessment of the property, your taxes are going to be based on new assessed value. And then preceding that, you're going to be under that same proposition where your assessed value can only increase 2% per year, which keeps your taxes from going up a lot very quickly. But as I mentioned, if you bought your house in December of 
2022. And then in December of 2023 or October, you're receiving your new tax bill at the new amount. They're going to go back with that new assessed value and recapture the tax difference from the time that you closed escrow until the new bill. And that is called a supplemental tax bill. So if, if your seller's taxes were only a thousand for, for simplicity, your, your seller had $1,000 a year in taxes, and now you're going to have $6,000 a year in taxes. They're going to go back and get that prorated difference between the $1,000 and the $6,000, so a prorated amount of $5,000, and they're going to issue you a supplemental tax bill to be paid in two installments. And that is why someone might receive a bill that has a year on it that they didn't own the home, which will trigger a whole bunch of questions. So... That's our first segment. I just wanted to go over initially um, how the tax year works, why you get a supplemental tax bill, and to just let you know that that tax year is not the same as a calendar year. In the next segment, we're going to go over an impound account a little bit. So we'll have another part of continuing on property taxes and explaining how paying your taxes or having an impound account works. So I hope to see you in the next segment. Fire Up Connect is the most innovative business networking group. Supporting and collaborating with a dozen of small businesses that are interested in building and establishing strong business connections. Hosting educational live seminars while carrying out business and community driven projects, as well as marketing programs as a part of its membership program. Fire Up Connect also offers virtual assistance with a wide range of services including inbound customer support, chat support, appointment setting and email management, graphic designing video editing, web design and development, social media marketing, e-commerce solution, content writing and much more. For more information, head on over to www.fireupconnect.com. Fire Up Connect, helping success stories unfold every day. Estate. Men of Real Estate Radio Show here on KCAA. Boats, mortgages can be purchased. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Basically, go to the radio station KCAA Radio.com. You can find us on your dial at 102.3 FM, 1050 AM, as well as 106.5 FM. This is Jim McLaughlin with Effective Action Consulting, and I've been a member of Fire Up Connect for, gosh, probably three years now. And what I really like about Fire Up Connect is the unique model that we go through, that we follow the agenda, so to speak, in the meeting that really has us uh, get engaged and involved with each other uh, in, in the meetings. It's not that we're individuals. It's that we're all really working together to better um, ourselves, our businesses, and the community through the projects that, that we work on. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to network with people in this environment. And it's really um, impacted my business in a big way. So take a look. Radio. Welcome back to the International Wealth Builders Radio Talk Show. I am your host, Michelle Estelle, the home buyer coach here on KCAA Broadcasting Network 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. Welcome to the second segment. We are going to continue with taxes in a sense, but we're going to cover impound account and how an impound account works. Um, a common confusion in establishing an impound account when you get a new loan is understanding why you have paid for the bill or a tax or insurance and also are collecting a payment in your monthly payment. So to explain how that works, let's try to give a visual. So what happens is that you are going to pay, let's say your insurance premium upfront for one year. So it is paid from today, March through March of the following year. So it's purchased in March, 2023, and it is due again in March, 2024. So you have paid that in full. In your monthly payment, you're also gonna pay 1 12th of that bill amount. 
It's going to be divided into 12 payments and then going to be included in your mortgage payment. If you think about it, you've paid for the whole year and it's due in 12 months more. So you start paying now, month one, month two, three, four, 10, 11, 12. At the end of 12 months, you have another year worth of your insurance bill. So when that bill comes due, the money that you've put into your impound account pays for the next renewal. That renewal now will be good to 2025. Your next mortgage payment goes into your impound account. The, um, the one twelfth of your hazard insurance bill goes into your impound account and you pay it again for 12 months. At the end of 12 months, you have a full year to pay your renewal. So that is how that impound account works. The same thing for your taxes. You're paying one twelfth of the annual bill as part of your monthly mortgage payment and it is accumulating so that at the end of one year there's a full year available to pay the renewal now a couple things the renewal isn't always the exact same amount most of the time your taxes go up a little bit and most of the time your insurance goes up a little bit so even though you've been paying one twelfth of, of the value of the current bill the next bill, let's say, could be $100 more. So you're $100 short of a full renewal premium. So you're going to have to increase your monthly payment, your monthly 1 12th of your hazard insurance bill based on the new bill. But you also have to pay the new bill in the current year. So let's say you're $100 short. What will happen is your lender will pay your insurance renewal at the new amount and then at the end of every year, usually in November, they are going to do an analysis of your impound account based on the bills they received that year. And they are going to say whether you have too much or too little in your impound account to cover the future bills. And then based on an aggregate, so based on January through December, the deposits that you make into your impound account and the bills that will be due and paid from your impound account. And they're gonna make sure that that impound account only goes below the amount or at least has a certain amount in the account at all times. So what this is similar to is your checking account. <laughs> in these days with uh, online banking, most people don't balance a checking account anymore. But in the old days, we didn't have online statements and we had to say, this is my balance. These are the bills that have not cleared. We have to subtract that from the balance and we have to make sure that we have enough to cover all the things that have not yet cleared the account. So it's the same with an aggregate analysis of your impound account. They're gonna look at each deposit, each withdraw, and make sure that that bottom line balances where that there's enough to cover the bills for the year. Now, considering that, um, the taxes, as we covered in the previous segment, uh, actually are paid each installment in a different year. Then when they do an analysis, they're gonna have the new bill, but at the end of that year, they do another analysis on a new bill for a new tax year. Um, so you can often have adjustments to that account. Now, where it is important to explain also is that I often get calls that my clients will say, I have a fixed rate mortgage, but my payment changed. So it's important to know that the components of your monthly mortgage payment, your loan payment is not changing. That portion of your loan payment is principal and interest. The principal interest on your loan on a 30 year fix will have 364 payments of exactly the same amount and potentially one final payment that could be slightly different. But your total amount you pay each month also includes one twelfth of your insurance, one twelfth of your taxes, and if you have mortgage insurance, that would be also included. Those items will change each year based on any fluctuation or change to your insurance policy or your tax bill or the current mortgage insurance that's due. So those things will change all the time. Think about it this way, even if you didn't have a loan, you would be paying taxes for sure. You probably would have good coverage on your insurance to protect your asset. So you would pay those regardless if you had a loan or not. 
Um, so if you don't have an impound account, you might have your house paid off already. So you're going to be responsible for paying your taxes and your insurance. Um, two installments of your taxes, one renewal of your insurance is most typical. And that bill is going to change each year and you need to be prepared. One year your tax bill might be 3000 The next year it might be 3200 So you're going to have to make sure you have the money to cover your taxes and your insurance each year. But if you have an impound account, we're going to collect that money from you divide it into 12 payments for each bill that's due, and we're going to adjust it every year based on an analyzing that account. If you notice on your mortgage statement, you're going to have um, a balance of your escrow slash impound account. Those, those terms are used interchangeably. It's an escrows, your escrows or your impound account, which is the savings account that the additional payment in addition to your mortgage payment, in addition to your principal and interest payment on the loan, that additional money will be set aside into a trust account called an impound account or an escrow account. And that account is where your bills are paid from. It's a savings account for you to pay those bills. Now, um, we mentioned before this supplemental tax bill in the previous segment. So if you receive a supplemental tax bill, that actually has not been taken into consideration um, straightforwardly in your impound account. Now, when your loan officer, if they did a good job, they would know a better estimate or maybe exactly the taxes that are due on the property that you're purchasing. And they'll have an idea that the sales price will be similar to the assessed value. So um, most of the time, your lender has collected that higher amount of taxes that, that is going to be reflective of your new assessed value in the future. However, when an analysis of, is done to your impound account, if you have not, if they have not received the new bill yet, then they will do the analysis and they have to return any excess in the account. So when they say balance, it's either high or low, short or overage. They cannot have any more money than necessary in the account and they cannot have a shortage. So they have to return excess money to you particularly when it's over a certain amount. Sometimes they can keep a small amount if you authorize it to stay in there, but um, generally speaking, they can only keep almost an exact amount of overage or balance in your impound account. So they're gonna have to return any money. So oftentimes what happens is that by the time they do the assessment, there is a surplus, they send it back to you. Then the supplemental bill ca came. Now you don't have enough money in your impound account to pay it. So then it's going to create a shortage in your account if you ask your lender to pay it. And if they do pay it, it'll create a shortage. Then they're going to do the analysis of your impound account and they're going to spread that shortage over 12 months. So not only are you going to have the increase to the monthly payment for the projected amount due, but you're going to have to make up the shortage in the account by them uh, uh, dividing that over six to 12 months to cover it. So, um, you always can know, you know, each year, like where that money is going by looking at your statements and seeing when bills get paid and also reviewing your tax and tax bill and your renewals when they come to you. So you can be kind of prepared for that. But the adjustment to your payment is just to cover those bills. If you have a fixed rate mortgage, your principal and interest is fixed, but your taxes and insurance can change, which will affect your monthly payment. So that's about how an impound account works. And uh, basically you can submit your supplemental tax to your lender if you have an impound account requesting that they pay it, but they don't have to pay it because there might not be enough in the account to do so. And not all lenders um, allow you to do that shortage. So you do need to check with them and see if they'll pay it for you. And if not, it is your responsibility to pay. So in the next segment, we are gonna go over how adjustable rate mortgages work. So I look forward to seeing you then. I hope you join us again for segment three. Fire Up Connect is the most innovative business networking group. Supporting and collaborating with a dozen of small businesses that are interested in building and establishing strong business connections. Hosting educational live seminars while carrying out business and community driven projects. As well as marketing programs as a part of its membership program. Fire Up Connect also offers virtual assistance with a wide range of services including inbound customer support, chat support, appointment setting and email management, graphic designing video editing, web design and development, social media marketing, e-commerce solution, 
content writing and much more. For more information, head on over to www.fireupconnect.com. Fire Up Connect, helping success stories unfold every day. Real Men of Real Estate. Real Men of Real Estate radio show here on KCAA. Oats mortgages can be purchased. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Basically, go to the radio station KCAARadio.com. You can find us on your dial at 102.3 FM, 1050 AM, as well as 106.5 FM. Hi, this is Jim McLaughlin with Effective Action Consulting, and I've been a member of Fire Up Connect for, gosh, probably three years now. And what I really like about Fire Up Connect is the unique model that we go through, that we follow the agenda, so to speak, in the meeting that really has us uh, get engaged and involved with each other uh, in, in the meetings. It's not that we're individuals, it's that we're all really working together to better um, ourselves, our businesses, and the community through the projects that, that we work on. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to network with people in this environment, and it's really um, impacted my business in a big way. So take a look. Stations Radio. Hello, and welcome back to International Wealth Builders Radio Talk Show. I am your host, Michelle Estelle, the home buyer coach on KCAA Broadcasting Network, 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. If you've missed any of our previous shows, you can watch us on our TV streaming channel, distribution on Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV, and the Android app. Just subscribe to the Building Solid Foundations channel to see our previous shows. Thank you for coming back. We are going to talk about adjustable rate mortgages or sometimes called variable rate loans. Uh, usually when we have fixed rate interest rates moving in the upward direction, a variable rate or an adjustable rate or an ARM, adjustable rate mortgage, um, become a popular option. But lately we haven't seen that this is very popular because the spread between the fixed rate and the adjustable isn't attractive enough to take the risk of that rate adjusting. Um, I think also there's a little bit of um, fear in the market about adjustable rate mortgages because of um, what happened in the past uh, with adjustable rate mortgages. So um, some people are leery of it, and I think investors are as well about the performance. But if it becomes an option that you have to take for helping you to afford a home or keep your payment down initially, then you need to know how it works. So I want to explain all of the components of a variable interest rate to you, an adjustable rate mortgage, so that you know what to look for and how to understand what's going to happen on your interest rate and your monthly payments if you choose a variable rate. Now, for the sake of this example, I think it's best to use um, maybe a home equity line of credit as an example, because that is a little more popular right now, and maybe something that you might look at if you already are a homeowner and want to take equity out of your home. You might look at a home equity line of credit, which is generally a variable rate type of product. So we're going to start with each of the components. There is a fixed component and a variable component to the interest rate on your adjustable rate mortgage. The variable rate portion or the moving portion is an index. An index is uh, the performance of a group of assets measured in a standardized way. So um, it's like, a, it's like a, an index regarding a fund or, you know, like a group of assets. So for the sake of ease, we're going to use prime rate to talk about this. So prime rate is a popular index used for um, home equity line of credit. And today the value of prime is 7.750. And it um, has been going up um, with everything else. So 7.75 is prime. And the fixed rate portion of a variable rate loan is called the margin. Now, the margin is based more on your current circumstances. It has to do with your FICO score, the state that you're borrowing in, the type of property that you have, the loan to value. Loan to value means... Um, 
how much is the collective loans in relationship to the value of your property. So let's say you have a $300,000 first mortgage balance and you have you want to borrow 100,000. So that's or right, let's say you have a 200,000 um $200,000 first mortgage balance and you want to borrow 100,000 home equity line of credit. Your total amount is 300,000. Let's say your property is worth 600,000. So you owe 50% of the overall value of your property. So that is called the loan to value. So each of these type of variables that have to do with your specific condition comes along with um, a little cost. We add those little costs together to come up with the margin. So for the sake of ease, we're going to say that prime is seven, a round number, and we're going to say your margin ends up being 3%. So we're going to say seven plus three is your start rate, which is 10%. So on this variable rate loan, your start rate is going to be 10%. The next thing that you need to know is the frequency of the adjustments. How often is the rate going to adjust? Is it going to adjust monthly, six months, 12 months, uh, three years, five years, and so on? Um, if your interest rate, let's say, is going to adjust every six months, that's the frequency of adjustment. So at, at, um, at six months, you're, they're, they're going to take a look at what prime value is then. And then right after that, um, the payment that's due right after that adjustment will be at the new rate if, if the index has changed. So if prime then goes up, then your interest rate's going to go up. So let's say for sake of ease, in the prime goes up a half a percent in the six months. So it was seven, now it's seven and a half. That's the variable portion. And your margin remains fixed. It's three percent. So now we're going to take um, the eight plus the three, and now your rate's 11 for the next six months, and then so on. So let's say six months from then, which was a year anniversary of your loan, prime goes down back to seven. Then your margin is fixed, your prime changed to seven, and now your rate is 10 again for the next six months because the frequency of adjustment is six months. Um, the next thing you need to know is how high the rate can go. What is the maximum cap? And then in addition to that, what is the cap for each adjustment? Every six months, if prime goes sky high, does that mean my rate does? If there's a cap on the lifetime and there's a cap on each adjustment. So you need to know what those caps are. Um, generally speaking, let's say each adjustment has a 2% cap. That would mean that even if prime goes up more than 2%, your rate can only change 2%. So let's say that in the first adjustment, prime is seven and it goes to 10. That's a 3% increase, but you have a 2% cap. So it can only go to nine. That's the maximum it can go. And then nine and three is 12. So now your rate is 12%. And then the next adjustment can have a maximum increase of two. Let's say there's a lifetime cap on this loan at 18%. So the maximum for the life alone that your rate can go up is to 18%. And the maximum it can change each uh, adjustment period, which is in our scenario, six months, it can go up 2%. Now the rate prime can go down. And so the rate can go down or it can go up based on that index, the movement of that index. The margin remains the same at 3% in this scenario. Now there's also a floor. So they can say, how low can the rate go? If prime starts to go in the downward direction, how, how low can my rate go? Well, it can be a number. The, the, the floor can be five and the max cap can be 18. Um, but generally speaking, you might have a floor that is your start rate. So if your start rate was 10, the lowest it can go is 10 and the highest it can go is, is um, 18. If it, let's say it could go to five. Since your margin is fixed at three, in order for it to go to five, that would mean that prime would have to be valued at 2%. So if prime went down to 2%, your margin stays fixed at three, now your rate is five. And if your floor is five, then your rate can go down to five. Now, um, obviously it's gonna depend on the um, information of your particular loan. Whatever your floor and your ceiling and your caps and your frequency of adjustment and your margin and what index it's tied to. Those are all the components for that. Now, as far as paying back a variable rate mortgage, some variable rates and HELOCs offer an interest only period. And that is where you only 
have to pay the interest that is due or the interest that has calculated on each month. So let's say you borrow a $50,000 home equity line of credit and your interest only payment starts out at $500 and you borrowed 50. You pay $500 per month, but you still owe 50,000 because you didn't pay any towards the principal. So it's ideal to pay principal when you can. It's also nice to have a lower payment and pay interest only, but you'll owe 50,000 uh, for the period of time that you pay interest only and you never pay principal. So it would be ideal if you paid interest only 500 and principal 500 so that your principal balance is going down because then six months you're going to have an adjustment. And then let's say your interest only payment goes to 600. If you're paying the thousand dollars per month, now it's going to be 600 to interest and 400 to principal. So if your loan has an interest only period, it's going to have something that happens after that interest only period on a home equity line of credit. It might be a 10 year interest only period and then 20 years to pay back the entire loan. So if you owed 50,000, you didn't pay any principal in 10 years, you're going to go 50,000 still after the 10 years. And they're going to take that 50,000 and they're going to amortize it over 20 years. Now you're going to have a payment that is equally uh, or portion of it is interest and a portion of it is principal and it will pay off in 20 years and you won't be borrowing anymore, but it still could have a variable component. So if it's going to pay off in 20 years, each time that rate adjusts, your payment is gonna go up enough to be paid off in full in 20 years. So those are all of the components of a variable rate. I'll just run through them real quick. It's the index, which is the variable portion, the margin, which is fixed, the frequency of adjustments, the cap per adjustment, the maximum the rate can go and the lowest that the rate can go and whether or not you're paying back principal and interest or interest only and for how long that will happen. So I hope that this was a good lesson on how a variable rate mortgage works so that in case if that becomes an option that's attractive and helpful um, for you to, to do in order to finance a property that you'll understand all of the components of a variable rate mortgage. Thank you for joining me on this segment. In the next segment, we are going to talk about what affects interest rates, what makes them go up potentially, and what makes them go down. And we'll look at all of the areas that affect us in the interest rate market. So I will see you soon in the next segment. Fire Up Connect is the most innovative business networking group. Supporting and collaborating with a dozen of small businesses that are interested in building and establishing strong business connections. Hosting educational live seminars while carrying out business and community driven projects, as well as marketing programs as a part of its membership program. Fire Up Connect also offers virtual assistance with a wide range of services including, inbound customer support, chat support, appointment setting and email management, graphic designing video editing, web design and development social media marketing, e-commerce solution, content writing and much more. For more information, head on over to www.fireupconnect.com. Fire Up Connect, helping success stories unfold every day. Real Men of Real Estate. Men of Real Estate radio show here on KCAA. Oats mortgages can be purchased. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Basically, go to the radio station, KCAARadio.com. You can find us on your dial at 102.3 FM, 1050 AM, as well as 106.5 FM. Hi, this is Jim McLaughlin with Effective Action Consulting, and I've been a member of Fire Up Connect for gosh, probably three years now. And what I really like about Fire Up Connect is the unique model that we go through, that we follow the agenda, so to speak, in the meeting that really has us uh, get engaged and involved with each other uh, in, in the meetings. It's not that we're individuals, it's that we're all really working together to better um, ourselves, our businesses, and the community through the projects that that we work on. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to network with people in this environment. And it's really 
um, impacted my business in a big way. So take a look. Go. Welcome back to the International Wealth Builders Radio Talk Show. I am your host, Michelle Estelle, the home buyer coach here on KCAA. 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. Thank you for joining us again. And I just want to let you know that this show is for advertisement and informational purposes only. There is no commitment to lend. We aren't talking about loan programs or interest rates for specific programs. We are just educating you on different components of lending and different things that you might have questions regarding and that I get questions on quite often in my industry. So today in this last segment, we are gonna talk about what drives mortgage rates. Um, we're gonna talk about six main factors that affect home loan rates. And obviously they are in um, a wide variety of things that you might not think are going to be a direct relationship to interest rates. And there's gonna be some things that you always thought were a direct relationship to interest rates that aren't necessarily um, the only thing that affects them. So there are many, many things on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis that will drive where interest rates go, whether they up or down. So the six components that we're going to talk about are economic data, uh, geopolitical issues or geopolitics, inflationary pressure on the economy, the Federal Reserve, whatever they talk about, whatever they say, whatever their announcements are, and the stock market and global events. So these are the six main factors that drive interest rates. And within them, within the six, there's gonna be things that come out in the news in these categories that will make rates go up and things that will potentially ease or have rates go down. So basically, under the first category of economic data, generally speaking, there's something called expectation. If some, something is higher than expected or worse than expected, better than expected, worse than expected, can have an effect on the market. Because generally speaking, um, investors are already trying to predict what the news is going to be. So if they think the news is going to be better, or they think the news is going to be worse, or they think the news is going to be better, but then it turns out worse. So if it's not what's expected, it can negatively impact or positively impact where the rates go based on that data. And so, as an example, rates going up might be um, non-farm payroll is higher than expected, or unemployment rates um, go down, or better than expected economic data overall. That can make your rates go up because something's better than expected, the interest rates could go up. When we generally have more unexpected news or negative impact on the news might be job data is um, stagnant or declining, or manufacturing is stagnant or slowing, or um, the housing market is weaker than expected. This could make the market, the interest rates go down. So under that economic data, a uh, key thing is, um, better than expected or worse than expected. Uh, as far as um, geopolitics, this could be other nations or other countries' economies. So for instance, if China's uh, GDP improves, interest rates could go up. Um, if there's tension between countries, or, or we often look at the tension in the Middle East, if there's tension in some of these um, global areas or countries, that could affect the interest rates. So interest rates could go up if there's tension. Um, in the same geopolitics, if a different country's economy is going down versus up, maybe our interest rates will go down as well. And if there's conflicts, additional conflicts or terror um, type of events that are happening, then interest rates could go down. Um, as far as inflationary pressure, um, what can make the rates go up with regard to inflationary pressure is high consumer price index, high wholesale prices, or um, higher earnings, um, hourly earnings. And then what might make the interest rates go down in inflationary pressure is lower consumer price, lower wholesale prices, and hourly earnings are lower. That could make interest rates go down as well. Now, as far as the Federal Reserve, 
this is often misunderstood because you hear on the news that the feds raised the interest rate half a percent. And oftentimes people think that that is the mortgage interest rates. Um, even though all markets are affected by things that happen in the Federal Reserve, they aren't raising a long-term rate. They're not raising the 30-year mortgage rate. They're raising a very short-term rate, which is the overnight rate that's charged to the banks or the banks are charged to each other so for borrowing the money. Um, so when the Federal Reserve speaks, it does uh, affect our economy greatly. Um, it also affects stocks and bonds, and it's really impossible to accurately predict what's going to happen to short-term rates. But if they're adding cash into the monetary system or creating a looser credit environment in an attempt to stimulate the economy, then rates could go down. And as far as the stock market, it's kind of goes in the same vector. So stock market is on the rise, then interest rates might be going up as well. And if stock market is in a decline, interest rates might be going down. And then as far as global events, when we have not too many global events happening, like um, very you know calm weather or no um, catastrophic weather or events, then interest rates might be going up. But if we have any hurricanes, typhoons, tsunamis, or earthquakes, large events that happen globally, then interest rates could go down. So you can see that kind of the overall theme is when things aren't good, rates are lower. And when the economy is stronger, rates can generally push up a little bit. So these are layers of things that affect the interest rate. So that's why they're moving and sometimes volatile. If we have some uncertainty in any of these areas, it can create upward or downward movement in the market. But uncertainty or better than expected versus worse than expected are a good indication of movement or volatility in the interest rates. Um, so that is my final segment. I hope you learned a lot today um, regarding property taxes, uh, adjustable rate mortgages, impound account, and what drives interest rates. And I thank you for joining me and I hope to see you next month. Legacy 1050 AM, Southern California. <laughs> NBCRadioNews.com. Last July, several GOP senators combined their 5 watt intellects to charge that inflation was rising because of, quote, insane tax and spending spree of President Biden and the Democrats. Never mind that the insane spending is for such sensible, productive, and enormously popular national needs as child care and jobless benefits. Mitch McConnell's rabidly partisan flock saw the chance to politicize the public's legitimate worries about rising prices. You poor consumers are made to pay more for basics, they squawked, because of Socialist Joe's investment in grassroots people. Follow the ricocheting pinball of the GOP's logic. One, they say that helping hard-hit families induces them to refuse to go to work. Two, this creates blockages in the global supply chain. Three, this causes shortages of everything. Four, this forces corporate bosses to raise all prices, which five, slams the middle class and poor, so six, lazy workers cause inflation. Whoa, Rube Goldberg couldn't have dreamed up a more fantastical diagram to deflect attention from what's really happening. Namely, that instead of an inflation problem, we have a corporate greed problem. Of course, the greed meisters insist that their pursuit of excess corporate profits has not driven any price surges. In our economy of free market competition, they snap. Prices are established by the law of supply and demand. It's the magic of the marketplace, they explain. But magicians don't do magic, they perform illusions. And the illusion of free market competition implodes when it hits the reality that our economy doesn't remotely resemble a competitive marketplace. This is Jim Hightower saying, for some 40 years, corporate-directed government policies have been transforming America into monopoly nation, letting the few gouge the many. That's where inflation comes from. The Tri-City Shopping Center in Redlands is serving up some really cool ice cream at La Micho Acana. 
Then get your chocolates and other delights from C's Candies. Moms and future moms who visit the mall can cool off and relax while they get treated like royalty at Shiny Nails or Francis Nails and then pampered at Texture Hair. The Tri-City Center is filled with retailers who care about you. Shop at the Tri-City Center in Redlands and see why they call it the Mall with a Heart. The message of Brother Stair lives on here in Southern California on KCAA, Monday through Friday from 1 to 5 a.m. Hear the worldwide broadcast of the Overcomer Ministry from the Faith Cathedral Fellowship. Call for prayer requests or to make a donation at area 843-599-1215, beginning at 1 a.m. Monday through Friday. Hear it here on KCAA AM and FM. Del Wamsley and the Wealth Cycle. This is the wealth cycle that I've taught for 30 years. Buy one house, 10 houses, an apartment, two apartments, 820, 500 units, 1,000 units, 2,000, 5,000 units. And as you keep putting the money and the profits back in, you become one of those rich people. And much quicker than you'd even believe. Learn Dell's Wealth Cycle at GiveMeTotalFreedom.com. Use promo code 2023. Save 60%. Code 2023. Give me totalfreedom.com. Give me totalfreedom.com. Hayward Environmental Consulting in Rancho Cucamonga reminds listeners that the American dream comes true with hard work and determination. Let's hold fast to the American spirit. It's time to return to the vision and competitive focus that has made America a world leader. It's time to mend our communities and our lives. It's time to get back to work. Let's unite with the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's from Hayward Environmental Consulting. Better environment for a better tomorrow. Here's Pastor Rick with a special message. Hi everybody, this is Pastor Rick Warren. Would you like to live an extraordinary life? One where you make a lasting contribution that serves God and blesses others? A life where you use all your skills and abilities and talents to pursue your dreams? Well, guess what? God wants you to live that life. In fact, he created you to live a life of significance as you pursue the dream he's placed in your heart. That's why I've written a new book called Created a Dream, the six phases God uses to grow your faith. It explains the process that God uses to deepen your faith as he moves you step by step closer to your dream. You can go to pastorrick.com slash dream and you can get the first chapter there. Thank you so much. I love you. Empire Talks Back. The attitude that, well, the little guy cannot win uh, seems to prevail despite the fact that over time we've seen that the little guy, if he is persistent, he becomes the big guy. Empire Talks Back. No, it's because maybe people figure out a little knowledge is like smoke. It leads to the fire. Empire Talks Back. I think this this drive for equality, this drive for justice uh, is gathering steam as opposed to fading out. I think more and more people realize the importance of uh, the freedoms that America represents. Empire Talks Back with Wallace Allen and Friends, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., on AM 1050 KCAA. But now it seems like things are finally coming around. Tahibo Tea Club's original pure pouty Arco Super Tea comes from the only tree in the world that fungus does not grow on. As a result, it naturally has antifungal, anti-infection, antiviral, antibacterial, anti-inflammation, and anti-parasite properties. So the tea is great for healthy people because it helps build the immune system and it can truly be miraculous for someone fighting a potentially life-threatening disease due to an infection, diabetes, or cancer. The tea is also organic and naturally caffeine-free. A one-pound package of tea is $49.95, which includes shipping. To order, please visit TeheboTeaClub.com. Tehebo is spelled T like Tom, A-H-E-E-B like boy, O, then continue with the word T and then the word club. The complete website is TeheboTeaClub.com or call us at 818-610-8088, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. California time. That's 818-610-8088, TeheboTeaClub.com. Bob Vila here with my home improvement tip of the day. Medium density fiberboard, MDF for short, can be a cheaper, more stable alternative to plywood if used in the right way. 
MDF is made from wood scraps that are broken down into fine fibers mixed with binders such as glue, then formed into sheets using high temperature and pressure. Most home centers carry 4x8 sheets, usually half or 3 quarters inch thick. MDF is often a bit less expensive than plywood. It holds its shape and you can use it for shelving, cabinets, trim, and molding. It's best for interior projects since it doesn't like moisture. One important caveat though, MDF contains formaldehyde, a suspected carcinogen. So you'll need to wear a respirator when cutting it and until it's properly sealed with paint or urethane, it continues to emit toxic fumes. That being said, if you take proper precautions when working with it, MDF can save you money and reward you with good results. Get more info at BobVila.com and right here at home with me, Bob Vila. Do you want to learn and get answers to questions not addressed in the mass media? Then you want to hear my show, Business Game Changers, with me, Sarah Westall. I have conversations with thought leaders who have the courage to address off-limit topics so you and your family have the tools to make the right decisions. Join me Wednesdays at 4 p.m. on 1050 a.m. and 106.5 FM right here at KCAA, that station that leaves no listener behind. News, weather, and talk from KCAA, broadcasting to the Moreno Valley, Corona, and Riverside. NBC News Radio, I'm Julie Ryan. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is slamming former President Trump for his social media posts this morning. Trump took to Truth Social to claim he'll be arrested Tuesday and called for his supporters to protest. The California Democrat called Trump's post reckless and said he did it to keep himself in the news. Trump's possible arrest could come in connection to the Manhattan District Attorney's probe into alleged hush money paid to former adult film star Stormy Daniels. Legal experts aren't expecting a possible indictment to have much of an impact on former President Trump's 2024 campaign. Former Deputy Assistant Attorney General Tom Dupree said an indictment in the case regarding hush money won't legally prevent him from continuing to run for the White House. He can keep doing what he's doing. There's no legal impediment to him continuing to run as a candidate for President of the United States. President Biden is calling for tougher penalties for senior executives of failed banks. Biden is asking Congress to give the FDIC more authority to take back their compensation and bar them from working in the financial sector. Biden's request comes after the recent failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Three children are dead after a fire in Baltimore early today. Fire officials say the blaze was reported shortly before 5.30 a.m. at a row home in West Baltimore. The victims ranged in age from one to seven years old. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Taylor Swift's highly anticipated Eras Tour is underway. The singer-songwriter played the first show of the tour in Glendale, Arizona, Friday night. Swift performed 44 songs over the course of her three-plus 